Hello, and welcome to uh, Gluing Up Panels Day. I'm going to apologize ahead of time for drinking a lot of Gatorade. My voice is very raspy. Could be a uh, sawdust in the shop kind of thing, hopefully. But here we go. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk through gluing boards edge to edge in order to make a panel. Now, I think this seems like something that's, I don't know, kind of a no brainer, like I'm gluing up boards, what's the big deal? But I, I think one of the biggest things to come out of this is my jointer is right there. We're going to get there in a second is the way that the jointer gets used in order to make sure the panel is going to stay flat. And that's going to make more sense when we get to it. Um, I see there are a couple things in the chat roll already. So let me see what we've got here. Um, I cannot receive this on my iPad. Um, I'm, I'm on my iPad right now looking at, and there's the, if I press play, this would be playing right now. So um, for me, um, I just use the web and go to www.goa.com, browse, live events, and then here we are. So I'm not sure what the disconnect would be for you there. Um, so Kevin says, we'd love for you to touch on jointing boards without a jointer. So um, we're going to use a joiner to make a straight edge. You can alternatively, uh, I, I think the, the best alternative to a joiner is a router table. And we've got articles and videos on this on WWGOA. Um, router table works great for this. I, I know for a fact we did this as a video using a Craig router table. So that content is there. Um, alternative, alternate from that, hand plane. Um, when I was teaching woodworking in Africa with the Peace Corps, we had zero power tools. And every board that we put together, every panel we put together there was done using a hand plane for that. That's not my uh, superpower. I'm okay with hand tools. I'm not great with hand tools, um, but that's another way to do it. Um, and then too, just there are, um, if you look on the web, there's a lot of stuff out there about shot made jigs, creating a straight edge, using a router. Um, the benefit to doing this with, the benefit to creating an edge with a router, as opposed to like a cirque saw or a table saw is um, the router spins at such a high RPM, you get a surface that's very similar to what we would get off a jointer. In other words, in other words the edge quality, the smoothness is very similar to what we would get from a jointer. So that's one of the benefits to doing it with a router. Um, that being said, um, in the Live Edge Slab book I did, I made a big dining room table from two book match slabs. And that joint was created with a track saw and a, and a track. Um, so I, I ripped both slabs using the track saw and that was a great joint when I put that together. So um, to sum that up, track saw, router table, shot made jigs, um, there are other workarounds besides the joint hand plane. Um, so Dean asks, I want to glue up edges of maple boards for a flat panel cabinet door. Is there a width which I need to, is there a width at which I would need to add a stiffener on the interior to prevent bowing? So if the, the starting point of all of this to get a good panel is that the material needs to be dried correctly, should be, um, if it's kiln dried, six to 8% moisture content, it needs to have the opportunity to acclimate to your shop your shop should be an environment that's similar to where it's going to live when it's done. So in your shop, uh, like in the shop here, I humidify my shop in the winter because houses in this part of the world are humidified in the winter. Um, so if you acclimate and you, if you do all those things, um, you should be able to glue up a panel and have it stay flat. When you look at, um, Oh, and you know, you see a lot of these pine tongue and groove doors that are put together that would have a batten on the back, but I think that's primarily done because they're tongue and groove siding. They're not solid wood 
boards like we're going to do today with three quarter inch thick edges that they're gluing together. So it has to have the batten. So in other words, where I'm going with this is um, if you do a good job gluing up the panel, I don't think you're, you shouldn't need battens on the back of it. Okay, here we go. This is for later. I'm going to put together um, some beautiful white oak today. So um, first step is to compose your panel. So I'm going to bring the camera in so you can see better what I'm talking about here. But what I mean by that is we want to look for the grain match, the color match. I'm using three boards. Where are those boards going to live relative to each other in the final glue? So let me get you a little closer to my work. Somewhere about there. That's what I've got. What I'm looking for here is um, color match, and that's pretty uniform already with these three boards. But then I'm also looking for grain match. So when I do this, straight grain to straight grain is easy. This has got some quarter sawn fleck in it, straight grain here. So I would probably do something like that because then the straight grain flows to the straight, straight grain, which flows to the straight grain right there on the edge of that one, which then transitions into the quarter saw. What I look for with this is best face, best grain, best color match. In other words, um, you'll see where people talk about looking at the uh, annual rings on the edge of a board, on the end of the board. You don't need to do that if all these other things have happened, which is the wood is properly dried. It's acclimated to your shop. Um, if that's the scenario, I have glued up 36 inch wide tabletops doing this exactly the way I'm doing this, which is go for best face without needing to pay attention to annual rings on the end. Now, once I know this, I have to keep track of this because this is how these boards are gonna live. I'm just gonna peek at the other side just to make sure I don't jump off too fast here. All right, I'm happy with that. So we wanna mark these so that we can keep track of how they're gonna come back together. A real common way to do that is with a triangle because then when we bring these boards back, the triangle creates one distinct way that it can be Put back together. So a triangle is a good marking method. So edge to edge, edge to edge. Now, before we go to the jointer, let's talk about what's going to happen there. The boards are going to go against the fence. We're going to hold that board against the fence. We're going to go across the top of the jointer. Now, I work hard to get the fence perfectly perpendicular to the bed but maybe it's off just a tiny, tiny bit. So when we get to the joiner, we're gonna use a very specific technique with these and these boards are here so I can show you what I'm talking about. So let me bring you back out a little. And now we're gonna be at the joiner. And here's what's going on there. I got the camera right. That's not it. Let's say, even though I worked hard to get the fence set, it's got just a little bit of an angle to it. And I mean a half a degree, one degree. It's off just a tiny, tiny, tiny bit. That's okay. We can work with that if we joint the boards correctly. So my example in this poplar is, if you look at that edge, I ripped it on the table saw at about five degrees. So I'm, I'm way over stating what the problem could be with your jointer fence. In other words, this is an edge that is not perpendicular to the face. Maybe that's gonna happen when we use the fence on the jointer. If we put the boards together, they're both cut at that angle. 
if we put the boards together like this, you're making a barrel. Because if we keep going, we're you know we're gonna boards going together like this. Hey, how are you? Just throw them anywhere. Yeah, thank you. You too. It's kind of always like Christmas in my shop because UPS is here almost every day. Um, if we put the boards together like this, we're starting to make a circle. We're making a barrel. If we put them together like this, we still have a dead flat surface. I can never keep the geometry geometry straight. straight. When we do this, these are either complementary or supplementary. I don't know. But the mechanics of it is when they come together like this, it's going to be kerflui. When they come together like this, they're going to be dead flat. So that's what we need to pay attention to with the boards as we joint them. So let's see the easiest way to show you this. On this board, there's my triangle. That's going to go edge to edge with this one. So when I joint these edges, on this one, this face will be against the fence. I just put an X on there. This is its mating board. On this one, this face is going to go against the fence. Then, this face, then, Oops, that's the wrong board. That's why we put triangles on there. All right. Begin again. This is our joint. On this one, this face, the back face, goes against the fence. Then on this edge, the front face goes against the fence. Then bring in the other board. And the back face gets the X, which is already there from my previous screw up, because that's going to go against the fence. So what happens by alternating and paying attention to face against the fence, if we've got a tiny, tiny angle on that fence, we're building in the concept that we're going to end up with a flat panel by allowing those angles to complement each other when we do the glue up. So sequence of events, compose the panel, figure out which face is going to be your good face up. And then the bottom line is at each joint, you're marking the front of this board, the back of this board, front of this board, the back of this board, front of this board, back of this board, no matter how many are involved in the glue up. So then when we come to the joiner, we're ready to joint those edges. What you need to pay attention to is I know I'm jointing this edge because there's the triangle. There's my X. That has to come to the joint like that with that X against the fence. I'm going to grab a little dust collection. jointing that edge, how do I know when I'm done? And there are two answers to this, at least two answers to this. One is the cast iron bed of the jointer is dead flat. So as this comes out and I'm jointing, I'm paying attention. I'm looking right here where the edge beats the cast iron. If it's meeting it seamlessly, if there aren't any gaps between the wood and the metal, then the edge must be straight. The joiner has given us three things, smooth, straight, square. So smooth is easy to understand. 
we're taking off rough sawn edges, we're cleaning up the quality of the edge. Straight from corner to corner, from end to end, dead straight line. Square is what we're getting by holding it against the fence, hopefully square. So the straight, the, the smooth and the square is automatic. The straight comes from the jointer doing what it does. So by looking at that, we can optically compare that edge to that cast iron. That looks pretty good. We're going to know more in a second. So from there, it's rinse and repeat. That's the edge I just jointed with that face against the fence. This is the edge I'm about to join. Now I have to keep that face against the fence. because that face was against the fence for the edge that's against the bed right now. When I go to do the other one, which mates with the other board, I automatically know it has to go like this. The other thing that's gonna happen here is the two edges I did first had been straight line ripped from my supplier. So they put it through a big machine, which is called a, an edger or straight line edger, and it does a cut to get one good straight edge on it. So those edges weren't bad, and it only took a couple of passes to clean them up on the joint. This edge is still rough saw from the sawmill. So you'll see this edge is going to take more passes. The end is drop test. We're still after the same thing, which is we need to get that edge nice and straight so it sits flat on the cast iron. So that guy's done. X against the fence. straight cast iron. The other way, or what is the other way, and I'm going to give you the answer to the test question right now, is we take that edge and we put it against the edge it's going to join and do this. And when I do this, if I hold that against, there's a big window right there, if I hold that against the window, I can't see light through there anywhere. So in this case, when I do this, what's cool about it is I'm actually testing both edges. Because if they may, if they join like this with no gap, then we know both edges are okay. So if I do the same thing here, this one lives with this one. On a big tabletop on that 36 inch wide top I was telling you about, which is also six feet long. I'm not doing this. I'm laying them on a table and pushing them together and making sure that the joints close. So an important thing out of this is that today's glues are great, but glue and clamp pressure does not make up for lousy joinery. The joinery has to be good. That joint has to want to close on its own without you having to gorilla grip a bunch of clamps in order to convince it to close. So it's really, really important that you get those edges straight. 
Um, I've told the story a bunch of times about, um, I just mentioned teaching in Africa. With those kids, um, when we would do glue ups, we didn't have enough clamps. We didn't have any clamps. So the kids would hand plane the edges and then simply do a rub joint between two boards. And that's how we did edge to edge glue ups. And they worked great because the edge quality was good enough to allow that to work. Let me look at questions quick and then we'll go to glue up. All right, so Leslie's asking, when marking the sides with an X, how does one handle the grain when it's backwards to ideal direction to plane or joint the edge? So good question. Um, let me see if I have a board that speaks to this. Lovely piece of cherry. So the other thing we want to accommodate, if we can, on the jointer, is um, think of the grain in this board kind of like hairs on a cat. So down here toward this edge, the grain is prevailing this way. So if this is a cat, the cat would very much like me to pet it in this direction because then those cat hairs lay down. And if you pet it in the wrong direction, it runs away, which is okay, because it's a cat after all. So with a board, you gotta pet the hairs in the right direction if you can. So with this particular chunk of cherry, it would be best to hand plane it in this direction, because that's gonna help the fibers lay down. It would be best to joint it in this direction. Typically the cathedral, the flames on a board, point in the correct direction of feed on the jointer. So in this direction, the jointer head is going to whoosh, 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 and help lay those fibers down. What I would opt for is I want to use the trick I just showed you about the X and the fence more so than I want to use feed direction. So my jointer, one, the knives are sharp, two, depth of cut is only about a 32nd of an inch. So a light pass, a good consistent, you know, not, it doesn't have to be an uber slow feed rate, but a relatively slow feed rate that would allow me to cut this board even in the wrong direction and still get good results. And that lets me um, take advantage of that X on the fence trick. X against the fence. Uh, Kevin says, I think you mentioned before, use the jointer mainly for edge joining. How do you flatten the flat side using a thickness planer if you have warping or cupping? So um, if a board is, I, I face joint, <clears throat> I face joint on this jointer. It's, it's part of the, it's a huge reason I upgraded from a six inch to an eight inch jointer. Um, my material comes to me S2S, surface two sides. As a result, um, it's pretty flat when it gets here. It's surface two sides oversized. So if I know I'm going to want three quarter, I get it S2S to 13 16 or seven eighths. Um, and then I finish it on the planer. Um, if I need to, then I face drop. If the board has got a real bad twist in it, you need to accommodate, you need to take some step ahead of the planer because you're probably, if you send a twist in, you're going to get it most likely a twist back out. So either through face jointing or work with a hand plane and um, shooting boards um, or even a power plane, you know, a handheld power plane can take the high spots off, but you need to do something before you send it through the planer to get it mostly flat. Uh, what depth are you cutting? Um, so that's a 32nd of an inch, very light depth of pass. Gary asks, do you ever use dowels or biscuits to help align the boards? So sometimes. So remember, just a second ago, I was talking about, uh, I'm going to talk and move the camera at the same time. Uh, I was talking about that big table I did in my Live Edge Slab book 
that was a really, really big and significant glue up. Um, big live edge slabs, walnut. And um, you don't need to add biscuits for strength on a typical edge to edge glue up, but it is good to add them in order to get registration. So in that case, I did. I added biscuits to the joint, and that way when the two boards came together, I wasn't arguing with them so much about uh, were they or were they not aligned. That, ironically, is where we're going to go next. So we're ready to glue these steps. I'm eyeballing them one more time to make sure they look okey and dokey, and they do. So for my setup here, I'm going to do a few things, starting with this block. Now, normally, on this small and glue up, I wouldn't do this, but I want to show you this, so if you need it as a trick, you have it. See how that looks. So first question, how many clamps do I need? So the way to look at this is the pressure comes off the clamp in a 45 degree cone. So when this clamp is positioned here and this one is positioned here in this 45 degree pressure cone comes off of there, is that cone overlapping in the middle? And I would say, you know, you don't have to get a, a protractor out and measure this. But just eyeballing this, these clamps are a little too far apart right now. They're too far to the outside. And I think when the pressure comes in, I'm not quite hitting this seam in the middle. So all I need to do is move these in a little bit. Now, the reason I'm up on blocks is that the question was just, would I put biscuits in in order to get alignment? This smaller glue up, no. Um, I could, in, in my case, I would typically just manipulate these by hand in order to get alignment. But I'm going to show you two tricks. One is these very, very simple calls. These are maple. They were jointed, so they're flat. More importantly, there's packing tape on here. So the reason that the parallel jaw clamps are up on blocks is so that once I'm putting this together, this call could go here, packing tape down. This call could go here, clamp, clamp. And the packing tape is preventing these from getting glued to my project and becoming part of my white bulk assembly here. Close up my clamps a little. Now for glue, a lot of you probably saw um, Tight Bond Bob was here not too long ago. And um, boy, I learned a bunch. So when it comes to doing edges like we're about to do, I have pretty much forever put glue on one edge. And uh, Bob, was, Bob was great. Um, he called this, you know, you're either a one edger or a two edger. And the downside to being a one edger is you got to work a little faster because you've only got glue on one edge. It's gonna dry a little bit more quickly. You've gotta get stuff put together in a good timeline. Um, the downside to being a two-edger is you're putting more glue in there and you're gonna have a more visible glue line. So I have, since Bob was here, I've stuck with being a one-edger, um, using conventional yellow glue for this. And part of the key is, don't just lay that bead down and put boards together. We need to spread that out into a film. And generally the way I state that is you want to end up with a fairly opaque film of glue. So maybe you can see the board through the glue, but kind of just barely. And a glue brush like this works really well. It's kind of like if you've ever done tile work, a good glue brush is a little bit like a mastic knife meaning it's leaving 
um, just the right, am right amount of glue behind, thanks to the bristles of the brush. I'm using parallel jaw clamps as opposed to pipe clamps or something similar. So what I love about these is that the jaws on these don't cock when you put pressure on them. That's probably like the single biggest complaint with parallel jaw or with pipe clamps is that they can tend to introduce a bow to an otherwise flat panel because of the pads doing that opening up. Um, so um, while I'm working, I'll tell the story of when I first started at my old shop and I was doing a lot of custom work, if I was making doors for a customer, I would glue them together one door at a time, even if I was making 20 doors, because I had one pair of parallel jaw clamps. But um, I believed in them so much, the, the efficiency of parallel jaw clamps, that it was worth waiting for that glue to dry before I started the next glue up. So there's my call going on. Now, one of the things you may have noticed is that I barely closed the clamps, the parallel jaws, when I did this. So we have to, we have to balance all the clamp pressure that is going on here. If I've already closed these snugly, then maybe these calls don't have the opportunity to pull the panel flat. If I close this like crazy, then maybe these won't have the opportunity to close the joints. We're going to do one more thing, which is out here on the edges, how do we make sure these are going to stay aligned, the individual seams on the ends? We're going to do that by taking another clamp, bridging the seam, and tightening the clamp. So the clamp pad front, clamp pad back are bridging that seam. And then with just a little bit of pressure, just fingers, that's pulling those two surfaces flush. Then when you close, and again, if I overdo this, that could prevent me from closing here. Now, when you close, as soon as you see glue beads, and I'll bring the camera in so you can see this whole setup better. As soon as you see glue beads coming out of that joint, you're done. So, um, again, in, you know, in teaching classes where people are making doors and doing glue ups like this, I see so frequently that people want to like, put a come along on this whole thing here in order to tighten everything up. When you do that, again, even with parallel jaw clamps, you're increasing the opportunity for this to bow under clamp pressure. So as soon as you see those beads form, that's perfect right there. Quit tightening these, you're done. And then again, here, just a little bit of pressure, a little bit of pressure, a little bit of pressure. That's gonna help hold everything nice and flat in this panel. Um, with these glue beads, I just leave those sit and then, I don't know, between now and lunchtime, next 20 minutes or so, these beads are going to get rubbery. And with a putty knife or a chisel, a glue chisel, I'll be able to come in here and slice those right off of the surface. It's a very, very clean way to deal with those. All right, peek for questions again. Wash down some sawdust. Um, so while I'm looking for questions, I want to point out too, a week from today, is our fall 23 showcase. We have got, I got to think a second, um, seven or eight, seven, I think, uh, manufacturers involved with this. So the showcase, if you've not seen it before, it's crazy cool. It's new products, it's cool products, and Paul Mayer will be here, and we're going to talk you through 
um, some neat stuff that we've seen in the marketplace. So that is normally on Thursday, we're at four. I'm pretty sure the showcase, uh, Max will correct us here in the chat roll. I think we're a half an hour early. I think we're at 3.30 on the showcase. Um, the other thing is um, it is fall. It's almost Halloween time. I did a pretty cool pumpkin on the bandsaw project a while ago. Um, the, we've got the PDF available for you on that pumpkin project. So just scroll down a little bit and you'll see it. And uh, you've still got plenty of October left to get a few of those pumpkin trays done um, before Halloween. Um, I have boards 10 inch, eight quarter, must be 10 inches wide, eight quarter, eight feet long. I only have a good router planner, a good router and planner, planer, I'm guessing. What's the best way to get a good edge? Yeah, so um, I would, you need, you're going to need to generate a straight edge that you could ride the router against and use that, you know, like I talked about earlier, like a, uh, use that like a jointer in order to clean those edges up. Alan says, after joining one edge, I thought I'd use a table saw to cut the other edge to make sure it's parallel. thought there's a possibility using the jointer, the two edges will be straight, but not guaranteed. So, you know, yes and no, it depends on what you're doing. In this case, so a very normal sequence of event with any material is joint an edge, rip to width plus a 16th, joint the sawn edge. In the case of a glue up like this, it's only three boards. So the rough sawn edge that remained on these boards was reasonably close to parallel to the straight line edge. So instead of going to the table saw with a jointed edge against the fence, cutting off the rough sawn edge, I just jointed it up. If this panel is currently a little bit of a trapezoid, I don't care because it's it. you would glue up a panel like this oversize and saying if it's a kitchen tabletop, I would do the same thing. You're gluing it up oversize and then that size is going to get refined after the glue is dry. So I'm not worried in this case about the boards, the two edges being a degree out of parallel. It doesn't hurt anything here. Is the wider the glue up, the wider the board you should use? A good rule. I glued up a 36 inch wide panel using five inch boards and it didn't turn out well. So no, you don't wanna go over wide. I mean, so the deal is any board might cup. So let's say it cups, I don't know, pick a number. You know, the cup is, it's a 10% it's a cup. A 10% cup on a six inch wide board is probably very barely visible. A 10 inch, a 10% cup on a 12 inch wide board is way more visible. So part of what using narrower stock does is it mitigates the opportunity for bows to happen and mess up your project. So you'll see, and I've done it myself, if the stuff you're gonna make a table out of, a big wide glue up, um, all comes in 10, 12 inches wide, I'll rip it in two and then in the glue up, I separate those boards. You don't want to just glue them back next to each other. Um, my rule is I'm, I'm using stuff typically around six inches wide for any kind of an edge to edge glue up to help keep the final result nice and flat. What about glue under the calls? Doesn't it dry to them? Nope, that's why the packing tape is on the calls. Myron says, if you draw the triangle with the apex straight up, the legs will always point the direction you must run through the planer. No need to put X's on the boards. Maybe. Always with the apex straight up. Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, it's up. Just a different approach. The bottom line is, when you get to the joiner, whatever works for you is cool with me. Um, keep track of face against the joiner. I mean, I'm guilty of once I have an array of boards and I know how they're gonna to go together, I don't necessarily do the X every time. I know if the face is against the fence for this edge, I flip and do this edge. Then I do the next board, then I flip and do this edge. So if you're, as long as you're opposite on every edge, you're still gonna come out. 
Uh, how do you clean the glue drip off the bar of the clamp? That was another great tip from Bob. And in fact, when I was getting these clamps out and there's a lot of glue on them, I was trying to remember the formula. Um, if somebody watching remembers, you can put it in the chat room. It was one third blank, one third blank, one third blank. So I think it was one third denatured alcohol. And then there's two more one thirds. Um, I'll, I'd have to go back and look at the live when Bob was here, but you make that mixture and you put it on the bar of the clamp. And even if the glue is bone dry and it's been on there for a year, Bob says it's going to take that glue off. So um, I have to try it on these because it's all my all my beams need to get cleaned up. Um, Max put up the link for the product showcase. It's in the chat roll. It is at three thirty one week from today. Gary says, I always use type on glue. I worry it might be too old from sitting on the shelf. Is there a way to tell or should I worry about age? Yeah, so go back, um, look at that live stream when Bob was here and he points out, um, and let me see if I can just remember, there's a stamp on these bottles. Yeah, it's kind of worn off of this one. Um, there's a stamp on the bottles and it's a, it's a date code that you can read. Um, so a couple things I found, if it's, if you pour the glue out and it's uber stringy, like it does, the string doesn't want to let go. It just kind of stays stuck from the bottle to the thing you're putting the glue on. Um, it's probably too old. I've seen it or smelt it develop a smell that's kind of gross. Um, at the end of the day, um, you know, I know that we all have budgets, but in the scheme of what I've spent on the project, this is probably the least expensive thing. If there's any question about the livelihood of that glue, that it's gonna work or not, I would just replace it. When gluing panel and the glue squeezes out, is it possible to stain and not have the glue show? Yep, you, you definitely don't, you definitely wanna be able to stain and not have the glue show, which comes down to effectively cleaning the squeeze out off. So that's, again, for me, my approach is I don't wipe this with a wet rag. I don't touch it while it's still wet like it is right now. When it gets to that rubbery stage and I slice it off, that is my go-to approach for making sure there's no residue left. Uh, Tim says, another professional said to max out clamp pressure since you want fibers to glue together, um, not a joint if all glue. To glue together, not a joint if all glue. Of all. Yeah, I, so I think that the salient point out of this is max out clamp pressure. Um, in my experience, for, I'm 62, for um, 50 years, I've been gluing stuff the way I just showed you here. When uh, Bob from Tight Bond was here, um, he said the exact same thing that I just said. So um, don't buy what I'm telling you, but Bob is the, um, is the technical guy from Tight Bond. And he said the same thing. Just as soon as you see the joint close and the glue come out, you're done. Um, Kevin says, I assume you'd want to glue up your panel with the outside facing up, given you can't scrape the partially glued cure from the underside. No, I, I do both sides. So even if I'm doing a big tabletop, I'll get another pair of hands in here and flip that over. I mean, it, this is easy. I can, I'll stand this up and take the glue beads off the bottom um, and on a much bigger glue up, I would find a way to do that so that I can get that squeeze out. Uh, it's just so much easier to deal with it when it's rubbery. Um, glue is hard when it's dry and I don't want to mess with it when it's that dry. It's going to be way too much work. All right, cool. Um, so again, a couple reminders. Grab that pumpkin tray download and make six of them because a bunch of people are going to want them once they see them. It's very cute. It's a great bandsaw project. Two, um, almost the same bat time, same bat station. A week from today, 3.30 Central Time is the product showcase. Bunch of cool stuff to show you from a bunch of different manufacturers. My friend Paul's going to be here. Um, he's maybe more of a tool geek than I am, so it's always great to get his input on this stuff. And um, that'll be very fun for fun for all. Um, that is 
it. We're caught up on questions. So Max, you can take us out. Thanks everybody for watching.